So for me, you know, brand is this sort of, you know, the energetic heart of a business or a city. And we all have a responsibility to help express it. And I think architects are ever so good at that. They just need to maybe open their mind to the brand world. Episode 84. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm in the fantastic offices of Caro Communications. And I'm speaking with founder and executive creative director of Free State, Adam Scott. So Adam is a architect, designer, and now the creative force behind Free State, who are an award-winning experienced design agency who are responsible for storyboarding some of the world's greatest brands. They've had clients like Virgin, Sony, and Melbourne Airport, to name just a few. And in this interview, Adam tells us the story of how he began Free State, how his career kind of took an interesting turn as he was moonlighting as an ideas consultant for the Millennium Dome, and then how he co-founded Free State with Ben Johnson and Charlotte Boyens, and how their practice has been guided and influenced by a love and passion for English landscape and casino architecture, uh, and how this has now kind of been built into the vision of what Free State does for its clients. So there's a lot of really interesting conversation here about branding, about experience design, about how um, creating brands for cities, for airports, for infrastructure, as well as for multi-headed large um, clients. And again, it's part of this really interesting conversation about the power of architectural thinking and how we can use this skill set and take it into new design sectors and fields and go beyond the traditional remit of what we consider architecture. So sit back, relax and enjoy Adam Scott. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Adam, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure to be speaking with you. Um, and you are the director and founder of Free State. Yes. Um, so tell me a little bit about how did you get started? What was the genesis of this, your very unique business that you operate that's kind of mm. straddling a lot of different disciplines and industries and sectors? Yeah. Uh, well, I suppose, I suppose the beginning was for us, I mean, we were at the Royal College of Art, my wife and I, and we were studying architecture and architecture, I mean, we loved it, but it, was, it, was, it seemed very slow. And what we were really loving, maybe more than that, we were doing club nights and festivals and shows. And what we loved about that was, you know, within the first few moments, whether you fucked it up or not, <laughs> because your audience are either not there or if they come, they don't remain. And that was liberating because you immediately realised that, yes, the venue's got a role to play, but also the acts, the MC, the DJ, the lighting, the sound, the invitation you sent at the beginning or the people that were on the door. And so that relationship of the hardware, software, humanware of the experience we saw that was critical to how you know, design should work, particularly design to inspire action. Yeah. And so off the back of that, we then, very naively, like people do when they don't have a clue, we set up a business 
and we'd worked, we'd been ideas consultants on the dome. And so that unique experience had, you know, inspired us to think, right, we should have a go at this. This is exciting. The relationship of, well, you know, particularly in that case, you know, experience meets mega brands. Yeah. And so off the back of that, we started working with MTV and Channel 4. And then we then grew to Sony and Samsung and doing shows all around the world, which were, you know, in those days, they weren't called brand experiences, but that's what they were. And then we started to sequence for those mega brands. You know, they all had uh, brand guidelines, but they didn't have experience guidelines. So we started then writing those for those businesses. But fundamentally, it was always the same as the club nights. It was how do you inspire attraction, involvement and belonging? Mm. And I suppose because those are valuable, you know, valuable emotions to inspire, then developers started phoning us up. So all of a sudden, it wasn't just about the brand builders, it was about the city makers. And now, whether it's, you know, lend or Melbourne Airport or Glasgow University, we're now beginning to look at how attraction, involvement and belonging work for those, yeah, city places, city people. So this, this is an interesting domain for an architect to kind of enter into, the world of brand building, essentially. Yeah. What is brand for you and why is it, why is it important for an organisation? And what does your architectural one kind of skill set allow you? Yeah. Allow, what, what kind of benefits do you have by thinking about brand as an architect bring to your, your clients? Yeah. I think, I think brand, I think sometimes people get a bit lost a bit lost on brand and architects, my architect friends, get very worried by the word brand because they think they think it's you know sort of just dirty sales. But I think if we just think of it as it it, it is it is the story, whether it's the story or the identity, if you like, of, of whether it's a city or whether it's a business, and it is demonstrated in many different ways through many different channels. And one of those channels is the built environment. Mm. If I think about you know, the great banks in Melbourne, those banks 20 years ago couldn't compete with the talent that was going to New York or go to London. So they then started innovating with their workplace, thinking about the building itself, thinking about the activity-based working interiors and the rich program of it. So essentially it was their brand in action. And because they did it so successfully, they were beginning to attract and retain some of the world's most interesting characters that wanted to work there. So for me, you know, brand is this sort of, you know, the energetic heart of a business or a city. And we all have a responsibility to help express it. And I think architects are ever so good at that. They just need to maybe open their mind to the brand word. So it's almost like branding needs its own branding for architects. In I a think, way. yeah. In Rebrand a way. it. Yeah. And so, so when you engage with the clients, what's the kind of, what is the, what is the thing that you're doing? What, how are you mm. developing a narrative? How do you create these stories with your, with your clients? And, is, yeah. and, are they, and is it a purely spatial narrative or is it involved with all the other disciplines that are, in, that are engaged with building what a brand might be? Yeah. So I suppose the first bit of that is, is where it begins. So on the whole, it will be before there's a project. So if I think about the work we're doing for Melbourne Airport at the moment, rather than a project to build a new terminal or, a, you know, whatever it might, might be, or a, or a project to think about a new technology stream, it is happening before that as a vision for the airport to think about their traveller experience. So on the whole, all, all of our projects will begin with a challenge that is how can we better attract and involve our audiences. And so to then answer your second bit of the question, then ideally that vision is media neutral. So it is there to talk about um, the emotions one wants to elicit. So, you know, for an airport, it might be, how can we better recognize our audience? How can we better inspire flow in our audience, in our users, in our travelers? How can we better you know, give them choice on their terms? And then you start writing the guidelines for every stream. So the hardware streams of architecture and interiors, the software streams of program and technology and content, and the humanware streams of behavior and voice. So a bit like those early club nights, you're thinking about every single touch point from a single story center point. Mm. And I suppose to answer your last bit of the question, ultimately the way you do that is you start with your audience, not just the demographic, but the psychographic, their enthusiasms, motivations, needs. 
you research that at a qual quantitative you know viewpoint so you know you're, you're enjoying the numbers and all the you know amazing marketing data we can get but then lots and lots of workshops lots of time with the ethnographers to look at the outliers and asking people what, not what they want now but what they want next and that's the beginning that's really interesting so the can you tell me a little bit more about that, that kind of, uh, that process of understanding the demographics, the people that are going to use the building? Because this is something that, as architects, we consider it maybe one-dimensionally sometimes. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, architects, I, I, we're, you know, a college, you know, it's so thoughtful and it is by nature human-centred. Of course, you know, IDO have, you know, helped us, it helped define and codify the idea of human-centered design. But in many ways, you know, architects have always done that. They've always been good ethnographers. You know, mm. They've good, been good at direct action and the eyes on the street and the care for the user. Yes. But what, I suppose what we're doing here is we're, we're supercharging that because we're saying to the client, we, we, we will only take part in this project if we can have, I don't know, let's say, six weeks to just look at that, to just look independently at the enthusiasms, motivations, needs of that audience. And because we've learned a lot from the world of marketing, we know how incredibly valuable that is, that you can't create a, a valuable end product if you don't really concentrate on that end user. And also critically, I suppose, again, noting the architecture point, you know, so often in, in projects, there isn't enough time or space. You know, strategic definition, you know, RIBA zero, is often only a few weeks. Whereas, you know, we're making sure that there's no even, nobody's picking up their pens for the first few, well, you know, almost few months before we get this, you know, get the direction right. And then, you know, we can help everybody, we can brief everybody, and they can ideally be more innovative because they better know their audience. Mm. And it's, it's quite extraordinary when, when you're dealing with other organisations, large, big brands, and you've, you know, you've, you've been working with, you were saying we're working with Virgin, as well, yeah, uh, for many years, for many years, and you've developed this kind of, and they're obviously, you know, a kind of such a successful brand. And yes. when you kind of think of their name, you just think of yeah. their, their, their focus on experience. Yeah. What have you learned from working with these types of large brands, and how have you sort of helped them facilitate the development of their narratives into into certain projects? Yeah. Well, I think I think the Virgin thing. I mean, that many people were a Virgin over the years, but one thing I, I loved about our first conversations with them maybe 12 years ago was a, a, a care for, yes, there would be, a, as part of the upper class experience, there would be a, you know, you know clearly a beautiful lounge and there'd be, uh, there'd be an understanding of the role of technology. But it was the way it was all integrated together, the way, you know, one would be caring about all of these touch points in the original vision that meant they were, yes, enjoying the hardware of the thing in terms of the lounge, which, you know, let's face it, they were competing at the time with British Airways that was building their cathedral to aviation at Terminal 5. You know, there's no way Little Virgin Atlantic could ever compete with that, with their, you know, 29 planes versus 300 planes. So they had to be then much more sensitive to the detail of each and every touch point. And so the idea of sending that chauffeur-driven car to your, your door to pick you up, to say, Ryan, you know, we, you know don't worry, you know, there's a little bit of traffic but you're already checked in and you know we've got your drink mix and we've got your magazine ready and then you arrive and you know somebody is not there behind a desk but they step out to greet you there's a lovely red celebratory light that's right there at the entrance that's drawing you in you know you're enjoying the theatre of entry and in many ways you know architects are great at this aren't they in terms of the narrative experience if we think of any mm. great processional piece of architecture it does that well I think all I'm talking about is saying and let's enjoy the temporal too. Let's not just do it for day one, but day two. Let's enjoy the lighting, the sound, the hosting, the voice, the technology to enjoy the theatre of the thing rather than just the stage set. Interesting. And so it's kind of like what, what you're saying is that architects actually, we do this normally with our buildings. And we understand the kind of, we think about this, the physical sequencing of a space yes. and how somebody's going to walk and interact and walk through it. Yeah. And you're taking that kind of thinking to how uh, a company would be ha building their experience for a customer. So yeah. when the company first engages with the business, yeah. there is a series of events that create an emotional response yeah. and a quality to that experience from every single... Yeah. 
I think that's right. I mean, we, we are, I think, you know, a lot of your audience, they'll be very sympathetic with, with this way, way of thinking. I think just, if I think about, like, you know, the big shows we were doing with, with Sony, that, uh, you know, and a lot of the, the big shows we, we still do, it's, it is, if you, if you are designing every single element, if you are rehearsing the staff, if you're writing the scripts, if you're briefing the technology, if you're, you're doing the storyboarding for the film, it means that you can ensure that that journey, it's not that you're directing it necessarily, but you, you're, mu you're much more intentional about how you're nudging your audience. Mm. And it's not duplicitous because, you know, they, everybody knows that you, know, you are there within those shows. There's a certain generosity that the brand puts on. And if you want to stay, you do. And if you don't, you leave. But it is, you know, the, the brand, you know, it is their, I suppose, uh, their opportunity to take all of these elements and to, I suppose, work them all in concert. And in many ways, that's what we learned from those, you know, brand experience projects that we're now using in the built environment. So whether we're talking about a university campus or a transport campus or a commercial campus, we're taking that spirit of everything in concert and then creating it in it rather than just for a four day show, looking at then how you might run it for every day. So yes, yeah, so tell me a little bit more about how you work with more of your developer clients yeah. and people who are a bit, uh, engaged with the physical placemaking and how mm -hmm brand experience is critical to establishing and kind of generating new parts of the yeah. city. I think the, the, the only, in some ways, rather than over-talking, it, it's, it's only about how you have a strategy at the very beginning that is cognizant of activation. So, so many, you know, businesses like these, you know, whether it's a university or an airport or a co commercial campus in Silicon Valley, you know, they all have strategies coming out of their ears. They'll have an estate strategy, a brand strategy, a tech strategy, a people and culture strategy, yada, yada. We're bringing that all together and saying it's all about the activation. It's all about the temporal. It's all about the program. It, you know, it, it's all for naught if it's not this lively, attracting and involving experience for your millions of people every day because they judge you constantly through the lens of experience this is the experience era after all and you know whether it's judging by what you can get online or what you can get on the high street we now want that in our university and in our airport mm. so all we're doing is we're saying we un let's get that program right in the vision and then everybody makes that program come to life rather than building or a few artifacts whether it's the architecture as artifact or technology as artifact everybody is responsible for the live program and that's that's how you do it amazing and how, how do you then approach your own business in terms of free state and building brand so there's because it's obviously it's a really sort of unique in many ways uh area that you're engaging with as you've got your up background and as an architectural discipline and you've got expertise in brand building and customer yeah. experience and almost been a pioneer in kind of creating a whole discipline in a way how do you then kind of take that expertise and then reflexively apply it into your own organization mm -hmm. so well, firstly, it's very nice you say it, it own discipline. I think really, one thing I, I, lots of lectures I've done, it, in many ways, a shaman in his or her cave 30,000 years ago is was just doing what we do. Is just, you know, there is, you know, the combination of the yes. cave itself, yes. the, the fire, ritual, the ritual, yeah. the dance, yeah. the, 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 you know, people in a circle rocking together, the shaman orchestrates it, nudges them back and forth, and then they have this moment of transformation where the shaman becomes the gazelle, and then they're all agreed that was extraordinary, and they tell everybody else, and it goes on and on forever. You know, this is all we do. We're yes. just, yes. we're just copying that, really. Yeah. Or you know Walt Disney in 1957. It's the same. I love I love that you said that actually because when, when we were chatting yesterday, I was think I, I was thinking, oh God, this is this is a really ancient thing in many ways. Totally. This, this kind of idea of how human beings have always made places has been through some sort of ceremony or yeah. ritual or there's this performative aspect that kind of demarcates a space first this kind of totally. these ephemeral ways of creating an entry into something yeah and you've, you've kind of taken it and it's you know developed it 
it's a very architectural thing mm. and then it's it's very applicable today yeah. to what's so important for brands absolutely and, and for and any it, organization yeah it's it, i mean the ritual bit it, it is it's so much about our understanding of, of ritual and i think you know even though some people ask us questions about it in terms of the world of through brand which was sort of our kind of backstory or architecture how we were educated you know when i when i sit with my kids you know, uh, uh, you know, within, you know, uh, with, you know a, a live theatre performance or sitting around a fire singing songs, you're going, right, I totally get how this works. Mm. And this is how communities are kind of, you know, stitched together. And the joy and, and the fact that that has real meaning to them because it's visceral and multi-sensory and multi-dimensional. And that's how we remember stuff is, yeah, fundamental to what we do. So, so that was the bit about... Yeah, it's not our discipline. It's always been there. Yeah. We're just codifying it, I suppose. And then what was the other bit? How do you how do you apply your expertise to your own organization? Right. How what's what are the rituals that you have in your own business? Yeah. I think in some ways, and I'm sure lots of people have this, that all the things you tell other people about, you're not actually often that good at yourself. And I think, you know, we are our, our rituals are that you know, for instance, you know, yesterday, you know, we were all in the countryside together and we're, you know, we're working not in a studio, we're, you know, going for walks, we're, you know, kind of making food together. Mm. And so, you know, we're just simple old fashioned stuff, really. We, we haven't, you know, we, we don't have certain things we always have to do. I mean, we have different studios around the world now and there's diff- you know, there are certain things we do which are all about eating together and going out together and the way we share stories together and, you know, um, the way we, yeah, begin those relationships with new people. There are things that we enjoy about that. But I suppose in some ways it's quite a social way of thinking about work. Yeah. And also because we have lots and lots of freelancers who are part of our world. Right, yeah. And so our care for people who are part-time, who, you know, pop in in a sort of peripatetic relationship with us and how we then respect them and go to them rather than always expecting people to come to our places of work, Mm. I think has become quite critical to how we work too. Because often, you know, the best people you want to work with, you know, don't necessarily want to work with you all the time. Yes. And that's that's super cool. So, uh, you know, a lot of the shows we've done, you know, the people that r- helped run those for us are film people or rock and roll people. So we learned a lot about how that they are still, uh, you know, there's a great care for our show even though all of them have a different relationship with our show and some of them might only be in it for a day and some of them might only be with it for a year, how we kind of celebrate the story of the endeavour and the fact that everybody has a role in it has become ever so important, I think. Well, how do you, how do you go about winning new work nowadays and how has that process changed from when you first started and you were yeah. doing these kind of the club nights and you, know, you were involved in that, in that sort of yeah. performance world? Yeah. How, has, how do, you, do you actively go out trying to find certain types of clients in certain kinds of worlds or yeah. is it kind of more serendipitous? Mm. I think the, well, because our, you know, because what we do, it's not like there's a course that does it or a magazine that does it or awards for it. Mm. So it's always been quite hard. You know, you, you need in some ways to yeah, seek out those kind of pioneering characters who you think might have a challenge that is yeah, the kind of thing that we can help them with. So, so going back to that thing I said about campus, I think the idea of campus, whether it's the campus as a collection of buildings and places, but also campus as a sense of relevance to a, a, a big and complex and multivarious audience, we're interested in seeking out people who, who care about campuses. We're interested in people who also are interested in breaking down silos so often our very best first meetings are where you'll have like the head of states, head of comms, head of tech, head of human resources around a table. So people who are at that level, but also up for that debate mm. is are the kind of people we're interested in. And I suppose, yeah, there's not that many of them. So we are, it's not that we're selective, it's just they self-select and there's not, you know, it's, it's a pretty limited group, but that's where we should be, I suppose. 
And how do you, you were saying earlier that you, you can, it, these can be quite long relationships that yes. you have with a client. How do you maintain that? Or what are, the, what are the, your keys to having, of creating those successful long-term relationships? And obviously the yeah. nature of what your sort of propositional work is can be in the ephemeral in a way. Yeah. Um, and so that often would need to be, yeah. it would needs to be responsive to however the organization is changing and the next yes. endeavors that they're doing and how their vision is shifting or... That's right. And, so I, and the context, obviously. I think the responsive bit is critical. I mean, it, it, our work is only useful if it's constantly relevant to the ever-changing audience and ever-changing right. organization. Yeah. And so in that sense, the thing I said about the understanding the psychographic and all the research that goes into it, that is something that we're always doing. So one thing that you know means that we're, we're useful to our clients is we keep on being with them, testing and evaluating and tweaking and improving. Not that we're there with them every day, but you know they'll be maybe every three months coming back, looking at it through this lens that we call the experience dashboard, looking at the relationship of people and program and place, and then helping them attune it to the needs of the organisation and the audience. But I suppose the other bit you're asking is, you know, how do you, you know, how does one maintain that long relationship? And I think fundamentally, what I love learnt from all those brand projects is the work is not ours. Mm. It's not even for the client, it is their work. And often a lot of my things I'm most proud of won't have free state on them. Nobody will know apart from me standing behind a column that it's our work. Mm. And actually that has been very important, that we're there to supercharge the endeavour of you know, the university or the brand or whoever it might be. We're there to inspire positive action for them. And free state is just there to enable and supercharge what they do already mm. and actually that that feels critical because then yeah you know that's I suppose a very sort of honest and straightforward relationship I'm not um yeah we're not trying to sort of steal their thun thunder or and we're very comfortably as consultants you know we're not being artists here we're, we're consultants yes and Presumably, then you're you're also working with lots of say internal brand and marketing yeah. conditions and constraints or That's things right. that have already been very clearly defined and set up, yeah. um, and also what you know the, the, a kind of a vision that's already been established. Yeah. How do you start to engage with those things and work collaboratively with internal? Yeah. Expertise. Mm. I think one, one thing is, is we, 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 you've got to wear lots of different hats. So that on the one hand, you may well be banging the same drum and telling the same story that you know of about attraction, involvement, and belonging. That is all you're talking about. You're just trying to get everybody up for that narrative that it's not about single endeavors or single channels. It's about the aligning of everything to achieve this narrative, to mm. inspire belonging. And then you talk to everybody in their own way. So, you know, we, we have team who are technologists by background, teams that are marketers by background or architects by background. So you are, you know, confidently and in a very kind, empathic way on their terms, listening to them about, you know, what is worrying them, what are the fixed points that are immovable and where there is space to challenge it. And in that way, you better align people. And also the very, very old fashioned thing, which I think architects are brilliant at, is it's a story that fundamentally brings everybody together. We're not talking about a design. Mm. We're saying that it is this story to inspire this in our audience. We know who the protagonist is. We can all agree together what's missing and what the opportunities are. And then there is a story we all rally around. And then that's our North Star and then everybody walks, works towards that North Star. And that, that's it, really. And it seems as well that what you're pointing to as well is that architects have this a very natural ability to be able to engage in the narrative of places and spaces. That's what we do. Yeah. And actually, this kind of, the kind of work that you're doing with, with Free State uh, is kind of underpinned by this architectural discipline. Yeah. What would you say to encourage other people who are in the architectural industry or their training to step outside the 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 sort of you know and engage with perhaps more non-material forms of yeah. architecture yeah well I, I i'm always blown away when i meet uh 
you know, people who you know, very you know, like whether very senior people in whether marketing or, or technology or branding or business who have an architecture background and it's been their superpower. They have used it to go. I understand the city. I understand complex relationships. I understand the, as you were saying before, the relationship between the macro and the micro, the individual and the collective. And as a result, you know, there that's you know that is incredibly valuable. Mm. And so I sometimes wish that actually there was at least modules within the architecture education that was comfortable with talking about architecture that is does not predispose that it yeah it's it's only a value if it ends in architecture that so much of what we learn is incredibly valuable above and beyond the building mm. and i think you know that as the ability to think about things in concert to hold it lightly and then bring it to yeah a clear narrative solution is you know is a superpower and i think we should enjoy that more Yes, and it and it kind of starts to point to as, as well the the difficulty of architectural education in a sense because the, the beauty of architecture is that it is so broad yes and it is so encompassing yes. and you were saying recently you you're you're teaching at Central Saint Martins in the yeah. narrative uh, spatial environments that's right what it what is that how does that differ from say traditional architectural thought yeah well I think so I yeah so I'm, I, I'm a fellow at uh, in, in, in narrative environments on their course. And so what that allows me to do is, because of, you know, Trisha, who's a wonderful lady who runs it, you know, got a little bit of space to think about where they aim the course and, uh, and, and the mix of, uh, of, of sort of modules and, and, and subjects they look at. And I think what, what's great about a course like that is it is where the, the, the narrative could be a, uh, you know, a sort of pro-social... Um, uh, sort of civic uh, uh, story, or could be a story that is about uh, a, a brand, or could be a, about a local business, and so they they take that as a beginning, and then look at what the you know how one might might express that through experiences and environments, mm. and I think that's incredibly rich because then the students can work out the kind of clients that they're interested in thinking about, the kind kind of uh, end user relationships that they're most fascinated by. Because they're, you know, getting quite a rich mix of, uh, you know, different sort of stories that they're interrogating there. And so, yeah, it's been a wonderful thing to think about. And also, I think I like the looseness of it, that sometimes the conclusions are more about technology than space. Some of them are about hosting rather than, I don't know, a landscape. But always there is the journey, the mm. narrative journey. And yeah. that is... Wonderful to see that because in many ways, as we're all we're both saying that that is that's an eternal thing. We've always, you know, designed like that. So it's great to see a course that sort of is interested in just that. And it's so interesting to you know this idea of the kind of uh, ceremony and ritual and how yeah. sort of fundamental it is to human culture, and how as architects we do become quite fascinated with 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 that because we understand. In, inherently how fundamental it is to making space yeah. like there's all this you know, it's not something that human beings are just you yeah. just suddenly start plonking things down there's yeah. often a, a, an emotional connection that happens yeah. with a particular yeah. place um, and what I think is also really interesting is how that that interest or that historical interest or that human interest yeah. actually has huge relevance commercially yeah and has huge relevance to what so many companies and organizations and anybody involved in any kind of leadership is trying to do is, is establish that culture yeah. Yeah. and architects are very uniquely positioned yeah. to be to be very masterful and fluent yeah. in um, in doing that yeah I, I couldn't agree more and i think i think that fluency i think is really interesting in that often it's then you know directed at you know a a, a significant project that is often um yeah, is is there? You know, has has got, is, is, I suppose quite 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 singular and singular in terms of its it, its type and how it exists in time. Where one thing I I, I think I, I would also commend to architects, particularly you know we're looking at a number of university projects at the moment, I'm, and I'm fascinated by the fact that you know to some extent the gold rush in university buildings and campuses has come to an end. It's going to be less about building multi million pound student hubs. 
and much more about how that live experience across the campus can be encouraged, encouraging you know people to spend more time on campus because ultimately, uh, you're you know you're you're best less likely to feel isolated. You know your 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 well being rises. You you'll get better grades. You're more likely to meet other people. Or less likely to drop out if you spend time on campus. Now buildings help that, but also all of those other meanwhile things. Noting that essentially the campus is always meanwhile is surely a place where architects could be incredibly valuable, mm. which will not be about the big picture thing that will necessarily necessarily win an award, but will be a number of sort of peripatetic, small, festival-like things that will be equally valuable. And I think that sort of fluency and fluidity of thought and to be open-minded to things of all different scales is, I think, what architects should also yeah. get involved in. And how would you, and this is, might be a, a, a difficult question to answer, but how, how would you advise or what would you suggest to students or young practitioners or even architects who are wanting to perhaps move out or or, or move into this kind of a different type of way of practicing how how would you if you were to give like a, a, a manual or a handbook of like how to do it and it might not be such a thing mm. but what would you say what would advice would you give to somebody to move away from this the the traditional practice of architecture yeah well I think I think it's it, it, I think in an ideal world the you know I suppose a lot of what I'm saying here is that the, the, the relationship between the hardware and the software you know the place and the program is the important bit mm. here and so I think any opportunities to turn up the programmatic I'd say are really useful so opportunities to be involved in live events opportunities where there's a project that has activation or direction or curation, those kind mm. of words in it. I think leap at those. Leap at opportunities to confront your audience, to be standing beside, behind that column, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And then ideally, I think, you know, straight out of college, rather than necessarily rushing to that big practice or worrying about your part three, to have time spent with you know events businesses brand businesses curation businesses getting involved in the live and programmatic i think is fundamental to yeah you know, what we're all about it's so it's so it's so interesting that you say that because there's you know there is a great culture of so many young practices engaging with pop-ups and doing events mm. and doing other sorts of things mm. and it can be so much easier in a way to start practicing and like having ideas actually executed and getting real-time mm. feedback from an yeah. audience rather than either speculating about a built proposition that doesn't get built or going into, you know, the tr I mean, there are certain architectural practice models where most architects will, you know, start a practice and then they end up going into, you know, residential. Yeah. And they'll end up doing sort of back extensions or stuff yeah. like that. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. That's, yeah. That can be a fantastic and very uh, part. But... If you're not wanting to do that, yeah. and that's become the, the thing, there is, there's loads of other sort of wonderful ways to yeah. just discover and play. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and to make mistakes, you know, I think that's also the other thing about, you know, doing, you know, live practice like this, or the way Moment Factory talk about it, about doing it in public. That I think, you know, we talk a lot about how successful King's Cross has been. But I think what Argent were brilliant at when in, you know, 2008, 2009, they couldn't build because, you know, the, the, the world was falling to pieces. They were doing, you know, they were up for live. They were up for events. There was theatre. There was the skip gardens. There was the art programme. And they were creating a place or a sense of place before there was a place because they understood the value of the live and of activation mm. and curation. And I think, you know, we know, of course we know that this is what makes for great places, but it's not just the physical asset. It is the liveness of it, it is the, 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 the operation, the sort of the supercharging with the energy of people and technology and emotion and the temporal that really connects with our audiences. And it's always been thus. It's just now it's easier to record it and share it and mm. sort of bang the drum. So I think, yeah, to get more involved in that, I think, and also to note that, you know, you know, the, the practice, I think, of architecture is, I find, yeah, I suppose I'm saying the same thing again, that, you know, I find so many other disciplines in so many other sectors fascinated by the architect, and yet somehow amongst ourselves, we do ourselves down. 
and I think that is a terrible shame. We're, mm. we're very, very. It's a very valuable kind of learning thing. But I think you need to think about it more as a foundation, and yes. then sort of wear it a bit more lightly. Yes, yeah. that's that's really interesting. Um, for you, what's what's been some of your proudest achievements with Free State? Um, well, I think the the, the, the ones I'm, 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 I'm proud of uh, some of the things we're doing at the moment where there's, you know, these vision for projects that are, I think, fundamentally, you know, if I think about what we're doing at Melbourne Airport at the moment, you know, that will be, it will be a much better experience for millions and millions of people. And I'm, it, rather than so often what happens in those places where you only sort of exist if you can buy you know, some duty-free or a overpriced handbag, here there's going to be, you know, a whole wealth of things that go on that are, some of them about financial transactions, but some about social transactions mm. and places to be, to be calm, to be quiet, to take a break, places to sit, to work, to spend time with your family, all those rituals better understood in this, you know, incredibly complex and often anxious place. And I think that will be a much better place for it. And so, you know, I'm, you know, I'm proud of where those projects are going. Um, I, I'm also proud of, you know, some of the, you know, those much smaller ones too. But I think I'm often proud of the, you know, the relationship of the people. You know, the fact that it's been, you know, whether it's been the writers or the filmmakers or the actors or the architects or the developers or the, you know, the investors and how they've all come together, and this virtuous circle between the experience, the process, and the end experience for the user, and how one sees that if you get that right, how you know, rich and positive, you know, it's often bumpy, but fundamentally how well the collective work together through the process, then that is writ large in the conclusion. I, I'm, I'm often most proud of those moments, actually. What would you say are the, the mistakes that are made in kind of trying to make a cohesive whole like that with lots of different uh, collaborators and consultants that's often made? Yeah. Well, I think, I, I mean, often a mistake is that there's talk of a vision that is, you know, you know, you know strategy, ideally, there, you know, is, is, is a relationship of the, 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 you know, the ends, the ways and the means. And ideally, the ends should be, you know, well described in terms of, you know, what this outcome is for this particular, let's say, audience and how one might then measure that. And then you are, you know, ideally, you know, open-minded about the, you know, the ways that will get you there, the kind of big how that's going to get you there. And I think what often goes wrong is it's not nearly as open-minded as people pretend it is mm -hmm. or people don't come to the table um, you know, in, you know, with often the kind of right attitude. So often, we, d we definitely learn this with our, with, with our work with Sony, that you then have many, many meetings before the meeting to ensure that everybody is aligned and they get it and getting a feeling for everybody's different language so that when they're in the room, they're really present and, you know, they get it in their own way. And so I think, I suppose, yeah, what often goes wrong is one assumes that when you put everyone around the table, it might work, where actually there's a huge amount of work that goes on behind the scenes to ensure that, yeah, there's a common understanding before we begin. So do you have to then be quite masterful in appropriating and adapting the language that you're using in order to be able to communicate to the specific, um, the, the, the different kind of, groups or people that you're working with so mm. you know the way that you might communicate the idea to the marketing team or mm. the way you might communicate the idea to the engineering team or yeah. the developers that you, you have to kind of package things slightly differently yeah. for each for each of those different voices yeah so so partly it, it, it's free state helping to helping to package it or or partly also knowing your limits and going well mm. i know here's the vision and, and here's what we're you know where, where we're trying to get to there's the ends and we want to you know inspire this kind of you know emotion in this audience in these kind of numbers at this kind of time across yeah in this kind of place now you expert in architecture help us do that help us bring that to life you expert in technology you know, I don't know the detail of this and I wouldn't like to presume that I do and I think it only goes wrong if you make assumptions and presumptions and try and be them like I do my, we'll do our ever so best to help them 
you know, get the the ends, mm. and then it's in their world to think about the kind of ways and means. Brilliant. And then we'll help direct them, and hopefully stand with. Them. Yeah. So what's next for Free State? Um, so what's next is, well, there's some very extraordinary commercial campuses in Silicon Valley that we're looking at at the moment, and I think that world of, yeah. How you, rather than it becoming about, you know, these extraordinary humbling environments, but, you know, experiences that, yeah, attract and involve that, you know, inspire people to want to take part on their own terms and have a rich program that helps them, you know, because I think presenteeism is something I'm really interested in at the moment. You know, people may well be there in the office or in the university, but they're actually not taking part. They're, di they're, engage they're disengaged or even actively disengaged. And so I'm very keen to how we might find ways to better draw in those audiences and help people want to take part more on their own terms. So I think that's the, the next sort of big thing for us. Brilliant. Adam, thank you so much for your time this morning. Right. Absolute been, pleasure. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.